Hello, this is Christine Linke, Webcast Manager at Premia, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this Premia webinar. Today, Dr. Murad Chowdhury will present Bank Internal Funds Transfer Pricing Models and Business Best Practice. Murad is Treasurer of Corporate Banking at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Dr. Chowdhury is also a visiting professor at London Metropolitan University, visiting professor at the School of Information Systems, Computing and Mathematics at Brunel University, and Visiting Teaching Fellow at the Department of Management, University of London. He is a Fellow of the IFS School of Finance and a Fellow of the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. So now, Dr. Chowdhury, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Christine. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so the subject of this afternoon's uh, lecture is Bank Internal Funds Transfer Pricing Models, or FTP Funds Transfer Pricing, as some banks refer to it. I prefer the expression internal funds pricing, but FTP is the common accepted term. We're going to look through uh, potential, or the, the, basically the objectives and the rationale and, and the benefits of a, of a robust FTP model. And then we'll, we'll look at uh, some elements of that, which are the funding policies that one needs to put in place at any banking institution. So this is, this is a discipline that's part of um, the liquidity risk, the overall liquidity risk management and the overall liquidity policy in place at any bank. And it applies to any banking institution, whether, irrespective of its size, irrespective of its business model, and irrespective of the space that it operates in, you know, whether retail and commercial banking only, or investment banking plus commercial banking, or indeed a, a global bank assurance model, you know, that, in, that, that covers uh, you know a wide range of financial uh, uh, markets and, and and products. So uh, let's uh, forward on to the next slide, and in fact the slide after that, because I've just run through the agenda, and I'd like to kick off first by saying that um, th this is very much as much art as science. There's no one size fits all FTP model. That's that's the main thing we should always bear in mind. Whether we work in risk management or we work in treasury or indeed we work in the business lines and we are asked to embed an FTP model, there's no one form or one set model. There's no particular right way to do this. There are some wrong ways to do this and we will actually touch upon this during the course of the lecture, but there's no one right way. There's lots of ways to skin this particular cat. And what's important is that the bank, any particular banking institution, embeds and implements the FTP model that suits its business model and suits the way that it's conducting its asset liability management. That's the first thing I need to emphasize. So there are wrong ways to do this, and pre-crash there are lots of examples of banks doing this in a wrong way, but there is no necessarily one right way to do this. The important thing to bear in mind is that when putting together an FTP model, we 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 remember what the point of it is. Okay, we have to remember why we want to have internal funds pricing. What's it? What's the objective behind it? What is it trying to achieve? And the main thing it's trying to achieve is to is to basically put in place a key ingredient of liquidity risk management. The main thing it's trying to achieve is to ensure that the cost of liquidity, i.e., the stress on the balance sheet that is generated whenever one originates an asset is correctly costed, correctly passed on to the business line, and thereby correctly passed on to the customer. And equally, that also results in the correct P&L or value add from that business line being calculated. Otherwise, we're going to fall into all sorts of problems that arise when we don't correctly cost the price of liquidity, and we don't pass it on, and we start reporting benefit or supposed shareholder value add that re is really reflecting a funding gain rather than genuine shareholder value add. Okay, So that's the main point of an FTP regime. By the way, I'm going to talk around the slides. I'd like, uh, hopefully you're reading them as they come up, but I I I'll always talk around them. I'm asked to go through bullet point through bullet point, uh, not a lecture style that I prefer. So the first thing to bear in mind is the rationale of an FTP model and what it is we're trying to achieve. And the third, and also, and secondly, the, so the correct P&L attribution is calculated. And thirdly, we also want to construct our balance sheet in a post-crash world, in a post-crash world where liquidity risk has been reaffirmed, as it always was in the true history, but forgotten about in the lead up to the crash. Liquidity risk has been reaffirmed as the principal risk management uh, discipline of a bank to, make, to, to ensure that we are liquid and sustainable liquid throughout the business cycle, 
it's come it's been reaffirmed as the important part of risk management and an FTP regime should ensure that the balance sheet structure the structure of the balance sheet the structure of the bank's assets and liabilities is what is what is desired so if you look at the last four bullet points on the first slide it's saying we want to incentivize the business to ensure that we essentially structure the balance sheet in the way that suits our business model and ideally that business model would have been set uh, on, on sound, sustainable basis. So in other words, we have a business model in place that we think is sustainable and we want to structure the balance sheet in a way that reflects that. And so therefore we have to incentivize the business to do the right things. If I had, for example, an inappropriate FCP model, I could end up, as certain banks did in the crash, during the, uh, up to the lead up to the crash, I could end up with uh, a balance sheet that has you know, very long dated assets exclusively funded by very, long date, very short dated liabilities. Okay, so I'm running a massive funding gap, which is fine in a healthy liquid uh, funding regime, but of course gets caught out the minute we have a liquidity stress event. Okay, if we go to the next slide, please. So um, the first point we want to remember is in an FTP regime, the stress on the balance sheet that is generated whenever I originate an asset should reflect the true economic cost. In other words, that stress, the liquidity stress that I, that I put onto the balance sheet whenever I originate an asset, I want to make sure I price for that stress correctly. Okay? And so banking being the business of maturity transformation, whereby we, you know, that's what banks do. They, they, they essentially fund in the short term to, to lend in the long term, essentially. Okay? Now, let's say we describe short term as, say, naught to one year or naught to two year. The vast majority of the balance sheet on the liability side will be sub two year. The vast majority of the assets on the balance sheet will be longer than two years. So naturally, I run a funding gap. That's accepted. That's maturity transformation. That's what banking is about. But I need to make sure that that liquidity stress is priced correctly and the cost of that liquidity stress passed on. Okay. Um, so it, it, that's, the, that's the main rationale behind an FTP. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the, what do we have then in internal funding model? If I go through, actually, can we fast? Can we go through one more slide? Actually, okay. Essentially, and then we'll need to go back a couple of slides. But first, let's look at this. What I've got is an internal funding regime where I've got the business lines on the left. Okay, so let's assume a bank that has. And by the way, even if the bank only had a retail banking business, the discipline and the logic exactly the same. Let's assume in this picture we've got a retail banking business. Uh, a private bank, what I've called wholesale, so in essence an investment banking type function, um, a corporate bank, and so on and so forth. These are the business lines dealing with their customers. And then of course, we've got in the middle what I've called their FTP center, okay? Now that's often, often the treasury desk. Now treasury, if we were to have a lecture on a treasury operating model, I'd need a whole separate lecture to discuss how that can be organized. So we won't go down that road. I mean, broadly speaking, you can have a front office treasury that deals with the, with the has a market access function, the market facing function, or you can have a middle office treasury, which doesn't have a market access function, you have a separate money market desk, and that middle office treasury is responsible for policy and governance. Either way, let's assume it's a treasury function that is the FTP center. So in the normal course of business, funding to and fro, to and from the business to, to the FTP center treasury uh, is, is generated as a normal course of business. So the retail bank will have loans and, uh, and deposits. Wealth division will be primarily liability rich because they are dealing with high net worth individuals. So essentially there will be a source of funding for the bank. The wholesale, probably more liability short in that they are generated, they're, they're investing in assets. And then the corporate, again, like retail, will be long in liabilities as well as long in assets. So they could be a source of funding. Maybe it depends what their loan to deposit business model is. All of those business lines will lay off their funds to Treasury, which is the clearer for the bank, and equally borrow for the, the, the money that they are on their borrowing comes from Treasury. The funding for the bank will be organic to the bank, so it could be retail deposits, customer deposits, and then any shortfall for a bank that's running a greater than 100% loan to deposit ratio, any shortfall is of course funded through the wholesale markets, capital markets, interbank markets, short and long term. So in this diagram here we see that the Treasury Center, the FCP Center, is essentially the clearer for the bank. If you could go back a couple of slides please. In practice, what we're, what we're talking about is, for an FTP regime, we're talking about 
the rate at which funds lent, are lent by Treasury. The other side of that is, of course, the rate at which funds attract when they are placed with Treasury. Okay? And I should state right at the beginning that uh, in an FTP regime, and we will have an FTP curve, it's both sides of the balance sheet that we're looking at. There isn't a separate regime. So if I am charging for one, two, three, or five-year assets through an FTP regime, I will equally be paying out for one, two, three, five-year liabilities. Okay, I'll equally be paying. So the business line that gives me cash for liabilities, I will pay out. And the business line that borrows cash from me because it's lending to customers, I will charge. Okay? And as I say there, the rate at which funds are lent by Treasury is much more critical issue than I suppose. Essentially, pre-crash. What's happened is, and I've got an example there, I've quoted UBS specifically because that's in the public domain. There was a report published by the OECD, uh, which basically highlighted uh, some aspects of the UBS shareholder report, its public uh, report and accounts, that talked about how its, uh, its uh, internal funding regime worked. And their structured credit business um, funded itself at sub-LIBOR. Now, like any large money center bank, um, UBS was able to fund itself at LIBOR flat or sub-LIBOR, which of course every business line in the bank then benefited from. Other banks, uh, which I haven't quoted in this in these slide packs. For example, uh, there were two or three European banks that operated in the fund derivatives business, and which which is essentially a very illiquid asset. You are lending to hedge fund to fund investors a leverage type setup, whereby they'll take the first loss piece and you will fund the balance of the investment. A very illiquid, a structured derivative uh, type product, uh, which it, it, very illiquid. Once you engage it, you're waiting for it to mature. You can't come off the balance sheet. And it would be funded at, say, LIBOR plus a small transfer price, let's say 10 basis points, across the term. So I could be, I could be generating a two, three, five-year illiquid asset funded at LIBOR plus 10. Now, that's fine when I can fund at LIBOR flat. An FTP regime is almost irrelevant if I am match funding and always attracting funds at LIBOR flat. Um, I'm not match funding because that's, the, gener that's the, the, the business of banking and maturity transformation. And post-crash, it's quite rare for a bank to fund itself beyond the three months at LIBOR flat. There will be some funding charge attached. Okay? So if I'm not charging the right amount for liquidity under my FTP regime, then I will end up not efficiently uh, engaging in resource allocation. For starters, I could, for example, if I'm a structured credit business, buy um, a five-year CDO tranche, pay in a pre-crash A-rated, let's say, earned LIBOR plus 80, for example, funded at LIBOR flat or sub-LIBOR in the case of uh, this particular bank, and then I'm generating a funding gain that, that looks like a shareholder value added. It looks like a credit gain. I'm holding an A-rated uh, tranche of a CDO note. But, uh, but an element of that, uh, that gain isn't shareholder value added. It's simply riding the yield curve, which is essentially the business model of the now defunct structured investment vehicle, the SIV product. The, the basic business model, the basic premise of the SIV product, the structured investment vehicle, was I will buy ABS, MBS, CDO tranches, anything from three to eight years in legal maturity, or expected maturity, let's say, and I will fund them by issuing three-month CP. Now, that's not, necess not all of that is genuine shareholder value added by taking credit risk. It's also simply riding the yield curve. Now, if I have a benign FTP regime, which enables me to ride the yield curve in that way, I'm going to be reporting an artificially inflated P&L simply by the funding uh, arbitrage. Uh, arbitrage is not my expression. It's, it's just a funding gain, but that's the market expression. So to avoid that, I need to price for liquidity uh, more realistically. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so the point of FTP is to ensure that the true costs of liquidity are passed on to the business lines. That's essentially that's its main objective. Okay? Now, we saw in the, the slide just now, the diagram, um, I've got liquidity being uh, 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 gen liquidity stress being generated when I operate when Treasury deals with the business lines, whether it's assets or liabilities. Okay. Now the first thing we want to make clear is the ac the acronym is here. The cost of funds is literally that. It's the marginal cost of raising term wholesale liabilities for a bank. Okay. Now that doesn't necessarily mean all its term liabilities are priced there. If I have a retail bank and it offers one, two, and three year fixed term deposits to customers. That will be at a lower rate than if the bank goes into the wholesale markets and issues a three-year FRM, for example, a three-year MTN. Okay? The retail bank funds cheaper. But when we refer to the cost of funds curve for a bank, 
we are talking about its marginal wholesale cost of funds, okay, the, where it raises that extra dollar of term funding. Now, TLP is off TLP, TL, term liquidity premium, is often used to refer, well, it's often used synonymously with cost of funds. People often say, my TLP curve is here, and you see that it's anything from 20 to 100 over LIBOR to 2, 300 over LIBOR from 0 to 10 year. They often use that synonymously with the cost of funds curve, meaning the same thing. Actually, they aren't, but that's the market, it's a market convention. It, the cost of funds is literally the cost of funds. The true TLP curve would be the liquidity premium that one is charged for raising term funds. In other words, how much over the swap curve do I have to pay um, if I'm raising term funds? If the five-year swap rate is X, and I want to raise five-year MTN, medium term note, how much over that X do I pay? That's my term liquidity premium. And in essence, don't forget, that premium over the swap incorporates two aspects, the credit risk of my bank as the issuer and the liquidity risk for raising term funds. The challenge is to strip out that liquidity premium from the credit premium. However, most banks use the term TLP as synonymous with cost of funds, so they don't need to do that exercise, okay? That's all well and good, no problem, as long as we're all talking about the same thing. When I put a charge on over LIBOR, when I lend internally from Treasury to the business line, I should be adding a liquidity premium, okay? Because there is a liquidity premium payable by me if I want to raise term funds. I don't necessarily pass on my overall cost of funds unless I've decided that I want to match fund that. And this is, a very, this is a real debating point. As I said at the start, there isn't one size fits all. There isn't one true model here in, that operates for every bank. Remember, banks don't match fund. In practice, they just don't. That's not what banking is. I don't advance a 20-year legal, mature, legal maturity mortgage funded with 20-year liabilities. I mean, for starters, I can't raise 20-year liabilities as a bank in the current era anyway. What I do is I lend the mortgage average expected life, let's say, eight years. Okay, and I fund it in the short term, let's say 0 to 1 year or 0 to 2 year. I should pass on a liquidity premium internally. I should pass that on because that way the business line is being charged for the liquidity stress it generates to the bank. What is the liquidity stress? The liquidity stress is I have to fund an 8 year essentially illiquid asset. Let's ignore for the time being that I can securitize that mortgage or I can some other way stop having to fund it, you know, transfer it off the, transfer the credit risk off the balance sheet or something. Let's assume it's an illiquid asset. Let's say it's a uh, a corporate loan, a mortgage, project finance loan, syndicated loan, on my balance sheet for some time to come, I have to fund it for the time until it's off my balance sheet, until it matures. So therefore, it's going to be, um, it's going to be generating liquidity stress. I need to pass on the cost of that liquidity stress. Okay, that's the TLP or the funds transfer price, the FTP. Okay, if I'm passing on the cost of funds, I should pass on the cost of funds for raising funding to fund that mortgage or corporate loan. Do I pass on the seven or eight year cost of funds? Logically speaking, the answer to that question can only be yes if I assume I'm operating in a match funding regime. As I say in the penultimate bullet point on that slide, at its simplest, a five year fixed rate loan generated by business unit will be charged to the business by Treasury ALM, the ALM desk, at a five year bank cost of funds. But that assumes I'm match funding, okay? I don't match fund because that's not what banking is. So instead, logically, I should be passing on the term liquidity premium. How much extra it costs to raise five-year liquidity if I needed to? Okay, not the five-year cost of funds. One thing to bear. Here's a thought. Here's something to think about. While we go on to the rest of the lecture, here's something to think about. If I was operating in the match funding regime and I always passed on the cost of funds for whatever tenor the asset was, so I'm generating a one-year or a five or a ten-year corporate loan, I must pass on the one or the five or the ten-year cost of funds. By definition, a bank would only ever be able to lend money to someone who has a worse credit risk or a worse funding rate than it, okay? And I don't think that's what banks do. Banks will have some um, customers, some clients who might well be a better credit rating than it, okay? And certainly in the post-crash environment. So therefore, um, uh, we have to look, ask ourselves, what FTP regime do we want? Are we operating in a fit matched funding FTP regime? Or are we recognizing that we're going to fund the majority of our balance sheet, you know, let's say, let's say we have 20 or 30% of true term funding, five to 10 year funds, and we have 20 or 30% of short term funds, not to one year or two year, and the balance is say between two and five year funding. But I've always got some funding gap. Am I going to recognize that I'm running a funding gap, a maturity transformation, and just pass on the cost of liquidity? 
or am I going to match fund and pass on the, the equivalent tenor cost of funds? That's the question to ask yourself. Next slide, please. Right. So, th th to carry on this theme, some banks, and I've, this, as I said, there's lots of thoughts on this, some banks think the FTP price should be the match funding basis. So, if I'm originating a five-year corporate loan, the FTP should be the five-year funding rate, or in other words, the cost of funds. Is this realistic? Okay. Should I always assume a match funding regime? Logically, my personal opinion to that is no. I don't, banking isn't match funding. That's just not what it is. Therefore, I need to pass on the cost of liquidity, but not necessarily the matching term funding rate. There's two ways to do this. I can, gen I can calculate my true term liquidity premium, not my cost of funds, which is not an easy calculation, by the way, even for banks that have a lot of secondary market debt in the market and can observe where their cost of funds is. It's not an easy calculation, I, but I can choose to do that, or instead, I can reflect the reality of a maturity transformation basis and simply have a flat cost of funds curve um, that after between two or three points. Um, now, I've just got a question come through here. We charge a liquidity premium. Would we then similarly pass back? Sorry, apologies, everyone. I'm just going to widen this screen so I can, I can read the question. Okay, would we then similarly pass back a liquidity credit to the, funds that, to the units that raise funds? Absolutely right. The answer to that question is yes, you do. As I said at the start, the FTP regime is two ways. It's bid and offer. So the corporate bank originating a five-year corporate loan should be charged a five-year FTP. We haven't quite concluded in this lecture what that five-year FTP should be, but it should be charged a five-year FTP. Equally, if the private bank is raising um, or any part of the bank is raising funds that have a term nature to them. Let's say they are contractually term liabilities or they are behaviorally term liabilities. Remember, even check accounts with one day or zero day instant access, behaviorally they're long-term funds because if you look at your balance, often a stable part of it, anything from 50, 60, 70 percent of that volume is always on your bank account, right? So. Um, it, that, that person raising the term funds also receives the FTP rate. So that's the answer to that question. That's a, that's a good thing to clear at the start of this lecture. So um, to go back to the, to the slides, when I'm thinking what charge I pass on, it can be the matching cost of funds or it can assume, or I can have a cost of funds curve that's essentially flat. And here is the logic behind that. In a liquidity stress event, let's say I'm in October 2008, I'm in a liquidity stress event. Does it matter the magnitude of my funding gap? So we go to October 2008 when it was very tight. Um, speaking from my, the, the institution I was working at at the time, we, we had a portfolio of bank CDs, short maturity, so they didn't have much long to go. There were good names, Barclays, HSBC, so AA, at the time, AA rated bank names, Deutsche Bank. In October 2008, we couldn't get a buyer for those CDs, and we couldn't repo them. So otherwise, previously liquid um, assets, we could not use either as repo collateral or outright sale to generate liquidity, which there's a lesson learned there for everyone, which is in a genuine liquidity stress event, only AAA sovereigns are truly liquid. But that's a separate debate, not for this lecture. But the point I'm making is, in a liquidity stress event, does it matter what your funding gap is? Let's say I had just one, let's say I had two, two identical banks each with one asset and one liability. One bank has a 10-year corporate loan funded with six-month liabilities. The other bank has a two-year corporate loan funded with six-month liabilities. They are still in a funding gap situation. Let's say I get a stress event, October 2008 style stress event. Both banks have got to cover that gap. The first bank doesn't have any greater liquidity stress, just possibly a bit longer. But at the time that the liquidity stress event is taking place, which by the way, under Basel III regime is assumed to be only 30 days, right? Under the liquidity coverage ratio metric of Basel III, the stress event is deemed to be, well, my, it's a 30-day metric. What's my stressed cash outflow in the next 30 days? An implicit assumption, therefore, that the, uh, the duration of the stress event is only 30 days. Personally, I think that's not conservative enough. But the point I'm making is, in an FTP regime, a gap is a gap. It doesn't matter whether the funding gap is five years or three years or seven years. 
Once I have to fund a gap in a stress event, I'm in, I'm in a stress situation. So I don't think you need to match fund. I think you can assume that once you get beyond, and here the crux is where I've exactly put this, the cutoff point, once I get beyond an asset of, say, three, four, or five years, any greater gap doesn't put me in any greater liquidity. That's my personal opinion. Okay. Therefore, and if we go to the next slide, please, therefore, I think you can have essentially a flat curve regime once you get beyond five years. If I'm going to pass on cost of funds, I can assume the cost of funds are reasonably flat beyond five years if I'm going to have matched funding. Okay. So I can have two ways to do this. I can get, pass on the genuine liquidity premium, or I can just pass on the cost of funds. And then whichever I do, I need to construct my, my, um, my curve. My cost of funds curve is easy. Well, in theory, it's easy to, um, <laughs> it's easy to, to calculate in that I should know what it would cost me if I wanted to raise one, two, three, five, or 10-year money. For some banks, it's easier to find that out than others. My liquidity premium is hard to calculate because I need to strip out my credit risk from my liquidity risk. In other words, I have to strip out what the element that I pay when I raise funds is due to credit risk of my bank and the liquidity risk of term funds. Okay? I should be able to use some proxies to calculate that. Now, the first proxy is, in theory, the CDS versus the asset swap. Pre-crash, I would have been a firm believer in this. Post-crash, I'm not so sure. But pre-crash, the theory is, I've got a bank. An AB, let any bank, right? The credit, there's a credit default swap price for a CDS written on that bank, or there's an asset swap price for a bond issued by that bank trading in the market. Credit default swaps are meant to reflect pure credit risk. So therefore, whereas an asset swap is both credit and cash, I've got to actually invest true cash. Okay. So in theory, the difference between those two is pure liquidity risk. Okay. So in theory. Pre-crash, there's some disconnect in the market, so it's not necessarily the full picture. But in theory, at least you could say, I've got a good idea of what the liquidity premium for my bank is by looking at the difference between the CDS and the asset swap. Well, that falls down, of course, because in some banks, not all, post-crash it's quite rare, but you still, do, you still do get it. With some banks, their CDS price is higher than their asset swap level. So, of course, you're suggesting they've got a negative liquidity premium, which I don't think really applies. There's no logic to it. But for most banks, that's not a bad yardstick to start with. That's to start with. We could then look down at some other proxies to find out what my liquidity premium is for raising term funds. My liquidity premium, not my credit premium. Okay. Um, the third bullet point, the third example there is another personal favorite of mine. Let's say I transact in an OIS, an overnight index swap, so the Sonia or the Ionia swap in, in sterling. Well, I, think, I think in dollars someone called them Doris, I'm not sure. But the OIS, the overnight index swap, what do I pay fixed on an OIS swap? of say five years compared to Faye fixed on a five year swap. That difference reflects some liquidity because one is the overnight, one is the term. Okay. The problem with that is of course the term swap still rolls over in a quarterly or semi annual basis. But some difference there is a good pointer. What about the cost of funds between raising one year money, two year money, five years and so on? That is in essence some well, not wholly, but majority term liquidity premium. If a bank issues a one year bond and issues a five year bond, in theory on day one, for the next 12 months, both bonds represent identical credit risk, in theory, for the next 12 months. So therefore, the difference in yield between those two should only be liquidity premium. Of course, at some point, the market may perceive the five-year bond to have greater credit risk even the next 12 months, which isn't logical, I agree, but the market may demand some premium for the term that also reflects credit. But in theory, the difference between those two bonds is purely liquidity premium. So again, that's a pointer for the bank. So those three. Um, and then finally, the last bullet point, the new issue premium over current. A bank has a five-year uh, MTN trading in the market today. It issues a five-year a five year that it issued, say, a few months ago trading in the secondary market. It issues a new five-year today. What's the difference? There's a liquidity premium there. So those three or four proxies are good starting points to try and figure out what your term liquidity premium is. And then once you work that out, you can construct an FTP curve. And that's the add-on spread you put onto LIBOR when you charge for passing a loan, um, funds from the treasury to the business line who's passing it on to its customer. Equally, if you ignore bid offer spreads, uh, that's what you would pay for term funding of the same term. Okay? Now, that's in an FTP regime that doesn't pass on true co matched cost of funds. If you are in a cost of funds regime and passing on matched cost of funds, well, you don't need to work out a term liquidity premium, do you? you your cost of funds curve is just your cost of funds. So you only need to work out a term liquidity premium if you're operating a genuine FTP type regime that only charges the cost of liquidity, 
doesn't pass on the matched, matched funding basis cost of funds. The next slide, please. We still want to work out any more TLP proxies, what is available to us. There are proxies available because not every bank, and I'm conscious and very pleased to see that uh, people listening on this webinar come from all over the world, literally, from all points in the world. For some banks, I don't have the luxury of an OIST price payable that I pay if I trade an OIST swap or a CDS, uh, liquid transparent CDS price on my bank. So I need to look at other proxies to try and determine liquidity premium for the bank. Okay, so uh, it might be peer groups, okay, or it could be a new issue premium again. So I try and get a coin to where I, I try and get an idea of where I could issue term funding, um, or I can see, as I said, where a peer bank is issuing term funds, and if they're a peer of mine, I should be in roughly in the same space. Okay, so. This is not an easy calculation to make. I'll, I'll be straightforward on that. It's, but it, it requires some study. But it's not completely impossible for most banks. And depending on what market you're in, it could be that for some banks they simply have no idea of a term liquidity premium. In which case, one can't operate a term liquidity premium regime. One has to operate a cost of funds regime and try and work out what my cost of funds is for term funding. And that's my, that's my internal pricing. The cost of funds is what I charge, either pay or receive. Uh, for funding internally with the other business lines. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, we've actually covered this, so we can move on from this slide, please. And I just want to pause there for anyone to have a um, to think about any questions they have before I go on to the next um, slide and then uh, hopefully you'll be able to type them through. Okay, we, we've covered this, so we can go to the next slide, please. I want to then, so we've made the point about um, the, the rationale behind an FTP regime, is to ensure correct costing of liquidity pricing that the business lines then incorporate into their pricing for customers, either pay or receive, is to ensure accurate P&L reporting, and to ensure that we incentivize the business to do the right business that suits our business model and gets the balance sheet in the shape and structure that we want. Okay. Here is what we could have started the lecture with this as well, but I wanted to start with the rationale and motivation. Consider the following asset types, a three-month interbank loan, a three-year floating rate corporate loan fixing quarterly, a three-year floating rate corporate loan fixing weekly, a three-year fixed rate loan, a 10-year floating rate corporate, and then a 15-year floating rate project finance loan. Okay. Now, as I say in the slides, we have selected these asset types deliberately to demonstrate the different liquidity pressures that each places on the Treasury funding desk. Okay? Listed an increasing amount of funding rollover risk. Basically, you're going from assets that are essentially illiquid. All of those are essentially liquid. They're not trading assets. Okay? But of course, the one at the bottom places the greatest liquidity stress on the bank because it's the longest term. It also fixes quarterly. It's floating rate. So I've got a refix okay, on a illiquid asset and then I need to fund that over time, okay, so I need to pass on the right, the, the, the right liquidity premium, okay. Now, I have a question come through here. Does the FTP regime then provide any significant advantage over the CO, I think you mean COF, sir, COG regime, in a complex business environment? So I think the question is, do I have do I have an advantage in an FTP term liquidity premium over the cost of funds regime in a complex banking institution? It's not a question of saying one has an advantage over the other. Okay, what one has to do is put in place a model that suits the business model of the bank and gets the business lines to do business that puts the balance sheet in the shape and structure that senior the senior executives want. Okay. The important point of this regime is to say, I want to charge the right cost of liquidity to the business lines. Okay? Each of those th does this. If I pass on a liquidity premium, okay, uh, in theory, if the business lines are doing their job right, they're charging the right cost for the credit risk of their counterparty, and I'm charging the right cost for funding liquidity. Okay? In theory, they're both equal. However, the cost of funds regime is more conservative by definition. If I'm in a cost of funds regime and passing on a matched cost of funds, so therefore I generate a five-year corporate loan, so the charge from Treasury 
to the business line is the five-year cost of funds, that's inherently a more conservative regime than the term liquidity premium regime. So you could say it has the advantage of being more conservative and therefore it, it, will, it will basically ensure that you're writing more conservative business, if you see what I mean. Okay, so there's no advantage as such, but the cost of funds regime in a matched funding environment is a very conservative way of doing business. It will basically mean that the bank is charging the full cost to the businesses of uh, advancing loans to customers, but equally it means the bank will only ever have customers who are a worse funding level or credit risk than it. Okay, it means it will write, it will push away business with um, how sh better credit rated counterparties. That may or may not be desirable. So that's something the, s the senior executive have got to think about. That may or may not be desirable. It's for them to answer what they want to do. But all else being equal, a, a matched funding cost to funds regime is more conservative than passing on just the term liquidity premium. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? Yes, I think we've already discussed this as well. The point is, do we want to have matched funding or not? Now, I've got in front of you here I've called it TLP grid, but actually this isn't TLP in the way I've defined it, is it? Because these are funding rates over LIBOR. So I've got sterling, euro, and dollar. Okay. Now just have a look at this. This is essentially a cost of funding curve. It's actually a COF curve. Okay. Just have a look at this. We've got, we've got, as I said at the start, a fairly routine setup here. So this bank could be any number of European banks here. Okay, or indeed, you, you, banks in both North America and Asia Pacific, if you consider this, we've got a bank that funds at sub LIBOR or LIBOR flat in the sub three months, which is quite normal. Once you get beyond the three months, you start paying a premium over LIBOR to the point where I get to one year, I'm, pay, I'm paying 85 over LIBOR. That's my funding cost. Now, it then gets to quite an aggressive rate. So by the time I get to five year, if I'm issuing a five year floating rate note, I'm paying 270 over LIBOR. Right. But then notice what happens to this cost of funds curve um, in, in this regime. That increasing term premium starts to decrease. It does go up, but by less, just by five basis points at a time. This is an example of a cost of funds regime that recognizes you don't pass on matched funding rates, okay? Because the true, I know for a fact, without naming the name, I know for a fact that the true funding rate, if this bank were to do nine or ten year FRNs, would be in the region of 450 over. Okay, so the true funding rate isn't being What's happened here is you have a cost of funds regime, but it reflects the fact that the bank doesn't do matched funding, and it has flattened out the cost of funds curve from five year onwards, recognizing that the liquidity stress from a ten year asset in a stressed regime, in a stressed funding environment, a la October two thousand and eight, is no different really to five years. Hence, I can afford to put a much smaller decreasing rate of term premium beyond the five year. So this is an example of a cost of funds curve regime where I pass on the cost of funds to the internal business line, but I recognize there isn't much funding. So beyond the five years, I'm pretty much flattening out the curve. Okay, so I hope that makes sense from the point. For this particular regime, this is a cost of funds environment where I recognize that much funds, so I'm flattening out the curve. I have another question come through now. So it is, in many African countries, the yield curve consists of an overnight interbank and six months and one year T-bills. How do we determine the liquidity premium with no bond issuance? With extreme difficulty, okay? You're not able to determine a term liquidity premium beyond one year in the regime you've just described, which makes me think that actual funding is, is correct me if I'm wrong, it makes me think that actual funding is concentrated in the 0 to 12 month area. In other words, the banks will fund the majority of their balance sheet with um, uh, contractually one day money, but which behaviorally long term, like deposit accounts, cust retail customer checking and deposit accounts, and otherwise from 0 to 12 month money market products. Okay, in that regime, you run a, pers a, a persistent long term gap. To charge for liquidity premium for someone who's generating a five year asset becomes a difficult thing to do. I have no idea what the term liquidity premium is for five year money, but I know it exists. Okay, I know it exists. I've got a yield curve that's overnight, six months and 12 months. I know that if I were to go to the market and say, I want to issue a five-year bond today, I know I'll be paying a lot more than the 12-month T-bill rate. Okay, I don't know how much more, but I know it's there. 
So I would have to try and work out subjectively what that five-year liquidity premium should be and pass that on to the business line. Now, even though that's a very difficult exercise, and I, without any market data points, it's difficult to answer, I, can, I frankly admit, it's still an exercise worth considering for this reason. It's because, that, it's because the shareholder value added being reported by the business line reflects an element of funding gain. Even though I'm funding it with 0 to 12 months money, the business line is reporting a gain based on the five-year asset yield that comprises the shareholder value added, which is the credit premium on the loan, plus a funding gain, okay? which is normal banking, but I want to be able to strip it out. I want to be able to know what it is. At the moment, I'm over-reporting the shareholder value added from that five-year corporate loan because I haven't added in the term liquidity premium. I don't know the answer because I've got any data points, but I know it's greater than the one-year rate. Okay, so this is something that requires further research. And maybe if there's no bond issuance whatsoever, I simply don't know what my term liquidity premium is. You could be subjective. You could simply say it's 50 basis points. You could, now that's out of thin air. I frankly admit that it's out of thin air, but at least it puts some discipline on the process. You could say we're going to take 50 basis points out of P&L being reported by the corporate loan book and simply put it on. Um, put it on an ALCO book. You know, no one benefits, it just goes into a central book and that's reported at the end of the year. That just, that's one solution. But you could put in a subjective term liquidity premium and take it from there. I see another question has come through. Does this grid incentivize a more li illiquid asset portfolio, a longer duration and a greater capital charge as a consequence due to the maturity factor? I, I don't see that it does. I, I, if, if you're, I think the question is saying, because I've flattened out the curve from five to ten year, does it incentivize more illiquid assets because I just do a load of ten year assets, fund it all in the short term? In theory, yes, but in practice, I am not funding ten year assets with ten year liabilities. I'm going to be funding both my five and my ten year assets with naught to five year liabilities, you see. So actually, I'm going to still have the same stress period funding gap but I'm just recognizing that I don't match funds, so I don't need to have a matching cost of funds after the five years. Okay? By the way, I should, tell, I should say now, when I've presented this at senior treasury seminars, I have some disagreement. Some banks think I, do have, I should pass on a true cost of funds, even for 10 years. But of course, that would mean no 10-year business ever being written, except to very poor credit uh, counterparties. Now, that may be what senior management desires. Okay? This is fine. Okay? Senior management may say, we want the average maturity of our loan book, our corporate loan book, to be no more than five years. Okay? That's fine. That's a, that's, if that's your senior management executive, ex, uh, uh, ex objective, then let's do that. Um, in which case, you don't need to even price up to 10 years. Do you? you could just say the curve goes to five years. You don't generate anything beyond five years. You don't need. I'm not a fan of using the curve to, to drive overall management strategy. The curve should be used to generate the right pricing. But if management believe they don't want to be writing 10-year corporate loans, they should simply instruct the corporate bank to say no 10-year loans. That's a very straightforward procedure. OK, I've got some more questions here, so let's go through them. Um, with, the T with the TLP flat 270 versus 200, why not take 9-year money for 25? Did the ECB do No, I think, did the ECB not do that with the LTRO for the Eurobank? They took out the rollover risk. No, this is a funding charge. I wouldn't be able to take nine-year money for 25 basis points. Are you suggesting that I would borrow and lend against this curve, 255 against 295, sorry, 270 against 295, yeah, and then just arbitrage the curve? Well, in theory, a business line could do that, okay, but, um, <laughs> and that's always a perennial problem, but that's, of course, not, that's not the point of this regime. You know, it's a two-way pricing mechanism, but if, if, a, if a senior management was finding that a business line was arbitraging its own internal curve, I'm sure that, that uh, the head of that desk would, would be out of a job fairly, sure, fairly shortly. Um, okay, I've got a question coming back on the, no, the lack of um, bond issuance and market data points. There is no bond issuance, but in reality, we take a much wider margin than a market with data points. That's fair enough. That sounds conservative to me, and I, I don't disagree with that logic. Okay, should we have the next slide, please? Further considerations? I'm thinking that we have covered this because I'm talking about um, I'm talking about whether which regime we are we want to operate in whether we want to operate in a match funding regime, 
a cost of funds regime that recognizes there isn't much funding, so flattens out, or a term liquidity premium regime that simply passes on the cost of liquidity as a spread over LIBOR rather than the actual cost of funds. Okay? Th this is not, there is no one answer to those questions. The, these are three particular options, and the bank needs to pick the one that, it's, that suits its culture and, and, and business model. Next slide, please. Okay, now I want to conclude with a discussion of, a discussion of what feeds into an FTB model, which is to have firm funding policies in place for each business line. This is, this is a definitely, imp this is a very important part of the FTP regime, putting in your funding policy for each business line. Okay, and the funding policy will dictate how the funding, the FTP regime works and it will make a distinction between different products and different business lines. Okay, let's take, let's take the, the obvious one, <clears throat> which we've already touched on. The first obvious one is the banking book. So within my retail and corporate bank, I've got a banking book. I've got banking book assets and liabilities. Okay, what are the issues that go into the funding policy? Well, one we've already touched on. Okay, do I have a matched funding regime? Do I have a matched funding cost of funds curve? Okay, there is no right or wrong answer to this. This has to fit the bank's own business model. But remember, if, if I'm happy to write 10-year loans, but I pass on a 10-year cost of funds or an imputed 10-year cost of funds, remember a bank can have an imputed 10-year cost of funds point without ever having issued 10-year bonds. Okay? So let's just assume I have a cost of funds curve that goes out from 0 to 10 or even 0 to 20 years, reflecting my true cost, my marginal wholesale cost of term money. Do I pass that on if a bank wants to originate 5, 10, or 20-year corporate loans? Yes, if that's my wish, but you will find that the business lines don't write that much long-term business except with the very poorest quality credits. That's something for the businesses to consider if that's what they want to do. Okay? So that's the first question to answer. We'll have a match funding regime. What about the frequency of curve updating? Okay? Um, unlike the trading, unlike trading book assets, so an investment bank bond trading book, for example, you know, the, the, the sovereign guilt trading, the sovereign bond trading, or something like that. The banking book transactions take time to bring to market. They're not one day or one week transactions. For a syndicated loan, from the first discussion to actually being written and the syndicate closed, will take a matter of weeks, if not months. So when we come to price the deal, we don't want a fast changing curve regime, okay, because that will make the deal impossible to price. So we need to discuss, and this is, this is, this is a matter for the bank's ALCO, we need to discuss what, um, what frequency the curve is updated. Okay? Let's just say it's updated every quarter. That's not uncommon. What's important is we review that at Alco, and if we're in a volatile market regime, we need to maybe change that to monthly. But equally, we don't need to have the curve reflecting the market price of curve of, of, of the market price inputs of today. We could have a moving average regime to smooth out the curve. So in other words, if I have a moving if I have a 90 day or a 60 day moving average, then what I could do is um, what, what I could do is is look to um, when I do have a curve change, just use the moving average of the last of the daily curves the last say sixty or ninety days, and that way the change to the curve will not be as volatile. So an issue to consider is the frequency of curve updating and whether I want to use a moving average when constructing my cost of funds curve um, to 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 to, move, to smooth it out a curve smoothing regime that has to go into the banking book policy, and you know is a decision for Alco. There's no right or wrong answer. Now, on a trading book, it's a whole different ballgame. Okay? On a trading book, in theory, trading book assets should only ever be on the balance sheet for no more than six months. I think in, in some banks, they have a churn rule, which says you know, a trading book asset should have been sold before 180 days. In fact, for some banks, it might even be 90 days. The point of a trading book asset is it, it's, it shouldn't be on the balance sheet for more than, let's say, six months. So I don't need to charge a term premium because I'm assuming I can fund 0 to 6 months fairly comfortably. I mean, you saw in the earlier cost of funds grid, uh, 3 to 6 months was 30 over LIBOR. So I could apply I could apply the 0 to 6 month FTP or cost of funds to a trading book with no real uh, controversy. What about the trading book that is funded in repo? A lot of bond trading or equity trading books will be repo funded, i.e. secure funded. So the, the, the asset, whether it's bond or equity, will be repoed out and funded in the repo market uh, minus a haircut. In a repo funding regime, the trading book is said to be self-funded. Okay, I'm going to come back to that point in the banking book in a second. It could be said to be self-funded. Whereby, so in, in which case, an FTP 
add-on doesn't apply because the trading book has it bought the asset and used the asset to fund itself. Of course, there will be a haircut, anything from 2 to 5 to 10 to 20 to 30 percent. That haircut is going to be funded unsecured, either, well, generally from the interbank market, because the trading book isn't supported, and we'll come to that in a second, but it isn't supported by a retail bank or corporate bank customer liabilities. It may be in a group structure. But a trading book will be unsecured funded the haircut amount from the money markets. That would apply, that would attract the TLP rate. Okay, the haircut amount would have to be funded at FTP or at cost of funds, but again, it's not going to be a long-term tenor, not a three-month or six-month. So the trading book shouldn't shouldn't uh, should be able to be one should be able to do a funding policy for the trading book without too much um, controversy. Okay, now let's go back. I mentioned in the trading book self-funded in a trading book environment that uses repo minus if you exclude the haircut, that's essentially self-funded. Okay, so. The issue of an FTP regime is less controversial. Just the haircut amount needs to be self-funded. It needs to be funded in interbank, and you apply that cost of funds curve for 0 to 6 months. Let's go back to the banking book. A lot of retail businesses, or even indeed corporate businesses, will be self-funded. Let's say you, let's take a corporate bank that has a loan to deposit ratio of less than 100%. A retail bank that raises pretty much all that it needs when it lends out in mortgages and, and personal loans. Do they, well, how do they fit into the FTP regime? Well, this is where I get into another subject that, again, you won't find 100% agreement on. If you talk to 10 Treasury people, you might get five different opinions. In this regime, I would have more than one FTP curve. I would have more than one cost of funds curve, okay? Because it cuts both ways. I've got, I've got, um, I've got a retail bank that raises cheap liabilities, you know, non-interest bearing checking accounts, very low interest deposit accounts, and is essentially self-funded. What's its FTP rate? And equally, uh, so what does it charge when it lends out in mortgages or personal loans or credit cards? And equally, what is it paid when it takes its retail funds and it deposits them at the Treasury Center, as per the diagram we had at the start of the lecture? Are you, uh, should, is someone suggesting I have a universal cost of funds curve that pays and receives that? I would say no. Not in a self-funded retail banking environment or a corporate banking environment, because the, cost of fund, the marginal cost of funds curve will be out of whack with its business model. The funding charge, the, the rates payable by a retail bank to raise funds, is lower than marginal cost of funds. Okay, so it needs to have a different FTP regime, a different curve. Someone said to me once, "How can you have that? You can't have two or three curves in a bank. You'll, it's all kind of mayhem." Well, it's not. It's only mayhem if you don't operate it properly. It depends how you organize this business. A self-funded retail banking institution, I don't think, needs to be applied the cost of funds curve. You can apply a more relevant cost of funds curve to it because no one is suggesting that the retail bank raises non-interest bearing liabilities and gets paid, and let's say they're treated as term money, so three or five year money, let's say three year money, and a lot of checking accounts are behaviorally three or four or five years if you look at the, the way the, the volumes change over time. If I were to do a graph of the, the level, the volume of funds in a retail, in a check account, They'll start off high, go down, they go back to that. They'll, they'll have a cyclical process, mainly as people draw funds out and then they get paid their salary. So check accounts in the retail bank have a fairly stable central balance, let's say 50% of their amount. In which case, am I, unless I trade that as three money, am I going to pay the three-year cost of funds to the retail bank for that? Well, yes, if some of those funds are then passed on to the investment bank or the corporate bank. No, if it's an entirely self-funded institution, because that would be wholly inappropriate. They would be getting a reward that didn't suit their business model. They would be raising check accounts for zero and getting the five-year cost of funds on it. That's skewing, that's skewing uh, their whole incentive base. But of course, what happens when, as you do in some group structures, where funds from the retail bank are used, for example, in other parts of the bank uh, to fund a loan to deposit ratio greater than 100%, then you would have a reward based on the cost of funds because their funds are being used elsewhere. So that's, that's how you would view a self-funded versus non-self-funded uh, business division. Um, before I come to the derivatives book, I've got a question again. Um, I've got three questions. The haircut for trading book is for market liquidity adjustment? No, the haircut on the trading book is what's given by the repo market. Okay, It's not a liquidity adjustment. Let's say I buy a bond, a corporate bond. I fund it in repo. The haircut with my counterpart is 20%. I will need to fund that 20% with wholesale unsecured money. So then I'll be attracting the wholesale unsecured FTP or COF rate for 0 to 6 months money. Remember, this is a trading book. So the asset will not be on my balance sheet for more than six months in theory. So I will only be charged the 0 three or the six months FTP charge for that 20% amount. That's because I can't fund it wholly in repo. Unless there's a 0% haircut in a repo market, I won't be able to fund anything wholly in repo. 
Okay. Um, the next question is, can you elaborate on the techniques to charge the FTP to the trading book and banking book? Discount versus internal rate of return? Charge the FTP. Okay, the way you apply the charge is usually via an end of month, what's called treasury allocation process. Okay, so the funds are either received from the business line or advanced to the business line by treasury, and that's booked in the system as an internal ticket. Okay, the internal ticket as opposed to the external ticket. I need to be able to identify these because the treasury shouldn't be generating a PNL from internal tickets. Okay, any PNL that results at the end of the year should get applied to an ALCO book or a central book. Okay, I apply that by treasury allocations process. So let's say I, I lend, I had one asset on the book, a five-year corporate loan, attract the five-year cost of funds or the five-year TLP. At the end of the month, that charge is, is taken out of the month-end reporting for that PNL line. Okay, I don't think I, I, unless I've misunderstood the question, that's how to apply the FTP. Um, I've got a question here saying instead of having several curves, is it not easy to use one curve and to symmetrically charge assets and pay liabilities? Yes, you could. Yes, you could do that. You could have one curve, as I've been saying all the way up until now. But my point is, if you have a self-funded business, okay, a retail bank, are you going to apply a wholesale market cost of funds curve to that retail bank if they're self-funded? Let's say I've got a retail bank that raises liabilities and just lends them on as mortgages and personal loans. That's it. And none of those retail liabilities are used elsewhere in the group. Am I going to apply the cost of funds curve to them? Well, to me, that skews their business. I don't think it's appropriate. But what if they do? If they do pass it on, then, of course, it is appropriate because they're now funding the rest of the bank, so they should be rewarded for that. So there's no right or wrong answer to that. I'm just raising the points for you guys to think about. Okay. Um, in FTP, how do we deal with the cost of capital? That's a very good question. This is not a capital charging regime. The answer to that question is you don't. The cost for capital allocation is a separate charge for the business line, say a month-end charge, a management account charge. Okay, You could incorporate the cost of capital if the, your cost of funds curve was made up as a weighted average cost of capital. I've said the cost of funds curve was is the marginal wholesale rate for raising debt, debt liabilities in the market, term liabilities. Okay. By definition, that's not your capital base, is it? Which is your equity. Okay. So my cost of funds curve is given by what it costs to raise term liabilities in the wholesale debt market. If I change my cost of funds curve into a weighted average cost of capital curve, so I incorporate the cost of equity in that as well and pass that on, then I would be covering for the cost of capital. But however, that's not how I recommend doing it. I recommend keeping the cost of capital charge separate. The cost of equity you work out as the required rate of return on equity. Okay, it's not free money. I've come across some institutions which, which essentially were free money. The, the capital should not be invested in risk-bearing assets. Let's say I work out. Let's say the required rate of return for shareholders is um, is 10 percent. Let's say, for sake of argument, required rate of return. So it's say in essence, that's my cost of equity then, 10 percent. The equity is not invested in risky assets. It's always invested in risk-free assets, either AAA governments or a, a cash deposit at the central bank. Okay, and the the task of returning 10% comes from the risk-bearing assets, which are funded using li li debt liabilities and non equity liabilities only. And the return from those assets must be sufficient to cover the cost of equity. The cost of equity I pass on at the end of each month to the business lines pro rata, depending on their risk-weighted assets. So if I've got one business line, the retail bank, then of course it gets past the whole equity capital, the capital charge. If I've got three business lines, they will be, they will be generating risk-weighted assets out of a total on the balance sheet. And of course, I pass on the cost of capital associated with those risk-weighted assets per each business line. Okay, so the FTP regime isn't cost of capital. You do that separately, but you can incorporate it by having a weighted average cost of capital in your cost of funds curve, rather than just cost of funds. But that's not how I would do it. Okay, if we can go back to the funding policies, um, if we go back to the funding policies. The trading book, the banking book, we've considered. We've considered how, there's no one right answer, but you've considered how you might apply cost of funds regime and the cost of funds curve to a bank that has both retail, corporate, and investment banking arms. And you have to take into account the consideration of um, self-funded versus non-self-funded divisions. Okay, very important point. Let's go to derivatives book. With derivatives book, in a derivatives world, we operate in a collateralized world, in the interbank market. The interbank market is exclusively collateralized now, I'm pretty sure exclusively, <laughs> in that a bank dealing in a derivative with another bank will have to deal under a CSA agreement as part of the ISDA agreement, and the, the derivative book will be collateralized. 
So the net position marked to market is passed over as cash collateral, sometimes as securities collateral, to the counterparty. Banks dealing with customers often have uncollateralized derivatives. Okay, So in other words, they're operating in an asymmetric environment whereby their, their interbank derivatives are collateralized and some, if not all, of their customer derivatives are not collateralized. Uncollateralized derivatives, if operated in conjunction, hedged with collateralized derivatives, generates a funding requirement because I'm now in an asymmetric world whereby I'll have collateralized derivatives. In theory, if I had, quick aside here, in theory, if I had a fully collateralized book, if my derivatives portfolio was entirely collateralized, in theory, I should have zero funding requirement because whatever I'm negative mark to market on one derivative is balanced by the positive mark to market on the hedging derivative contract against that. So if I'm fully hedged and fully collateralized, in theory, I have no funding requirement. But banks, a lot of banks operate in an asymmetric world whereby they will have some uncollateralized books, so uncollateralized derivatives. So therefore, that generates a collateral funding requirement. A funding requirement that has to come out of the wholesale unsecured market and pass on for counterparty. How do I charge for that? That has got to be at the tenor of where you expect your expected positive, your EPE and your ENE, your expected positive earnings and your expected negative earnings in your derivatives book. Okay, so I need to construct a model output for my derivatives portfolio that shows what cash flows I'm expecting over the next, well, over the term from now until the final maturity of the last derivative on my book. I need to construct that cash flow model. EPE and ENE for my derivatives portfolio, and then each bucket gets charged the FTP for that tenor bucket. Okay, either pay or receive, depending on cash I'm expecting in or cash I'm expecting out. The cash funding of a derivatives book is two things: it's the collateral requirement, and of course the cash flow of the derivatives themselves. And so I've got interest rate swaps. I'll be expecting coupon payments in or out every three or six months until the swap book is matured. Okay, so I apply the relevant FTP charge for that bucket, which is the next slide. Okay, but before we show the next slide. The last two bullet points, the fourth one, retail versus wholesale banking FTP, we've already discussed this. In theory, you could have more than one cost of funds curve. This is a management choice, how you want to fund it. There's no one right answer here. I think if you have a self-funded division, it doesn't apply. If you have a division that passes funds on that's used by another division, then you probably want to have one cost of funds curve. The last bullet point, dynamic FTP based on net funding position. This is another point I want to raise okay, about and my FTP regime is not static. This is the very important point. There's two very important points I raised. Well, the first one at the start of the lecture was there's no one size fits all. The second one I want to say is it's not static. Okay? In other words, <clears throat> you review what model you have in place and remember you want to set it to drive the business to do the right business that suits your business model. So therefore, Depending on what your funding position is, whether you have a large funding gap, you're exclusively short funded, or you've got some term funds coming in, you, you might want to adjust your FTP regime to incentivize the right thing. Let's say, for the sake of argument, I'm concerned that the bank is too short funded. So if I look at my ALM grid, my ALM chart, my, my funding gap, you know, the mismatch chart, um, my liquidity position, there's lots of terms for this one thing. If I look at that and I think, oh, it's too much of a funding gap, or too much short funding, I need to incentivize the business to bring in long-term funds. I need to incentivize the corporate bank and the retail bank and the investment bank to bring in long-term funds. So I adjust my FTP regime to pay above term FTP or term cost of funds for term liabilities. So I'm incentivizing the business to bring in term funds. Equally, if I've got enough term funding and I'm now fully funded or I'm long funded, I need to adjust the FTP regime so that term funding is no longer rewarded in the way that it was previously. So the point of that is to say my FTP position should be dynamic and it should reflect my net funding position. It should reflect what I want to incentivize the businesses to do and what type of funding I want them to raise and equally what type of assets I want them to generate. Remember a conversation we had earlier. If the bank doesn't want to generate 10-year corporate loans, I mean personally I think you could just say that. But if, if the management aren't willing to do that, they could simply set the FTP curve or the cost of funds curve to ensure that a 10-year loan was never written. And one way to do that is to pass on a matching 10-year funding rate. It'll never get written, except the very low credit quality, quality counterparties, which you may not want to do anyway, because they wouldn't pass your credit quality test. They wouldn't pass the credit committee. Okay? So that's one way to, to look at it. So, but what the important thing is I do have to review my FTP regime quarterly at least. Well, six months, anything from quarterly to annually. But I need to review it and it needs to reflect my net funding position, and it needs to reflect what I want the balance sheet to look like in the medium term. Okay? If we go on to the next chart, 
that's just an example. To be honest, uh, it, the next slide, please. It, it could actually that could actually just be just an ALM grid. But the point is, if I look at this derivatives portfolio, here's an example. I've got I've got an EP. I've got depending on which bucket I'm looking at, I've got cash either coming in or out. This is a static position today. So what I do in my treasury allocation regime is apply the relevant tenor charge, cost of funds charge, to those buckets, okay, and and apply that as part of the treasury allocations each month. Now, one further point for derivatives funding is: are they considered as unsecured or secured funding? In other words, should I apply the wholesale marginal unsecured cost of funds, which is what happens if I raise five or ten year term money through an FRN in the capital markets, or should I have a secured funding charge applied to this? What do I pay if I raise secured funding, let's say a covered bond? Derivatives can fall between the secured and the unsecured. That's a debatable point. Generally, the answer is I apply my wholesale cost of funds curve to the derivatives portfolio, but there's a case of saying actually I apply the secured one because it's under a secured regime. Okay, that I think is that. If we can have the next slide, please. Uh, well, that's actually a very biased and one-sided bibliography for you, so we don't need to linger on that slide. Okay, that's uh, the end of the presentation. I want to thank you for that excellent presentation, and we thank the audience for joining us. I just wanted to mention that Premia is having a global risk conference from May 14th through the 16th, 2012 in New York. You can find out more information about attending, exhibiting, or becoming a sponsor at the event by going to www.premia.org. Thank you all for attending this premium webinar. Thanks very much, Christine. It's my pleasure.